The following podcast was recorded at the ANZUX Safety and Quality Conference 2014, Rapid Response Teams. Chris Nixon gives an ICU registrar's perspective on the Rapid Response Team. G'day, uh, my name's Chris Nixon. I'm currently a fellow at the Alfred in ICU, and um, uh, thanks very much for sticking around to hear me talk about this job, the uh, registrar's perspective on rapid response teams. So it's always good to start off with some disclosures. No, I'm not a crack addict. Uh, it's just that I have no financial conflicts of interest, and I like to think of myself as being as pure as Charlie Sheen's smack. Um, <laughs> Now, just before I begin, um, can I get you to put up your hands if you are an ICU registrar? Okay, so there's a couple at the back. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Now, if you are an ICU consultant who used to be an ICU registrar working with rapid response teams. So there's a few more, but it's still sort of less than probably half the room. So I guess that's why I'm here, because um, uh, Whoops, I've got a trigger, trigger finger there. So I'm here really to uh, try and convince you that the registrar's perspective is important and hopefully show you, obviously it's not as important as the ICU liaison nurse, but, um, uh, but uh, to com and to show you why. And hopefully give you some insights into why that is important for rapid response teams and also how rapid response teams impact on the ICU registrar. So a good place to start is uh, this paper, which uh, Daryl Jones has already uh, talked about from the ANZIX core met dose investigators, which basically showed that um, in, in hospitals in Australasia, the study mostly looked at tertiary hospitals, that uh, about 75% of the time, uh, an ICU registrar was involved in all of the MET calls. So there you go, uh, registrars are important. Where the, the, It looks like the rapid response teams can't really work effectively unless the registrar is doing their job. Uh, obviously, there's a bit more to it than that. Now, I currently work at the Alfred, um, uh, which has probably the most sophisticated sort of rapid response team that I've personally worked in. But I'm not going to talk too much about that because later on today, there's Kyle Brooks and Amy Krepska who are going to talk a bit about things from the Alfred and tomorrow, Owen Rudenberg. So you can look out for those. Um, but I've only been at the Alfred for about a year and a half, and before that I've trained in seven hospitals around Australia and New Zealand, both islands of New Zealand, um, and uh, three states and territories. So I've seen a few different ways of doing things. Um, uh, so I guess, what do I think about rapid response teams? So this slide suggests not very much. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, I guess uh, I'm not that interested in what I think, to be honest. But for what it's for what it's worth, I'm a I'm a fan of rapid response teams. I've certainly been that um, uh, junior doctor, 18 months out of medical school, um, being the sole uh, respondent to a medical emergency that consisted of a 18 year old uh, woman who. Um, was in the process of having a cardiac arrest, having just delivered or miscarried a baby into the toilet and um, had to try and deal with that situation whilst covered in vomit and doing one of my first intubations while I waited for senior doctors to arrive. So yes, I am a fan of the rapid response team. Um, I think it's, it's not a matter of should we, but how should we? Um, and I think anything that overturns this inverse care law that um, has afflicted the way we've done medicine for many years, the idea that the, the sickest patients um, in greatest need of help are often treated by the people least equipped to look after them is certainly something that we have to do something about. But anyway, that's, uh, that's enough from my perspective. What do other ICU registrars think? So probably the best place to um, uh, to start is this paper by uh, Jacques Settel that again Daryl uh, mentioned briefly in his talk and basically this was a, uh, a survey of all 356 um, 
uh, J Fickham trainees, so ICU trainees um, that were around in 2006. And about half of those were actually working in ICU at the time. So um, although there's 136 responses there, the response rate's not as low as you'd think, given that um, uh, not everyone was working in ICU. And again, this mostly represented larger hospitals. So obviously there's some problems with this uh, in that it's about eight years ago that this was actually conducted. It is a survey, so there's only um, so much that you can take away with it. But to make it even better, I decided to do my own super good fun Met Call survey, of, uh, which I sent out to 30 people and got a superb 77% response rate. So I'm going to, interestingly, it got pretty much the same conclusions overall as that paper. So I'm going to use it to add a bit of color to um, the findings from the, the, the Jack study. So what they found was that 78% uh, of ICU registrars were involved in METs um, and 39% uh, of them spent half of their time on duty uh, in, as ICU registrars also on duty for MET calls. 56% had zero to two calls per 12 hours, which um, certainly by Al Alfred standards, I would say is pitifully low. What, what are they doing with their time? And um, uh, the, But the call length, interestingly, is significant. 74% of the time, it's over 20 minutes, and about a quarter of the time, it's over half an hour. So what this really all adds up to is the fact that MEC calls are certainly the largest non-ICU component of an ICU trainee's workload. Um, and uh, one of the other things that came out of the study is that the workload was much the same day and night, of course, as we all know, but staffing isn't. So given that it's such an important component, one of the questions I thought I'd ask in my survey was to get a feel for the gut, the gut feeling of ICU registrars. So what were the first three words that spring to mind when you hear the words met call? Um, one of the interesting things that I discovered that was that many ICU registrars cannot count to three. But of, of, the, um, <laughs> of the ones that fit the criteria, um, I'll let you just scan your eyes over these words, but you, you kind of get a feeling for that a lot of the time people are thinking, you know, it's not really an emergency. You've got to walk to these. Don't run. And they're very repetitive. So here we go again. Do I need to go bugger me again? Um, uh, but then it's kind of uh, tied in with that is a few key words like resuscitation and end of life, which really I think gets to the core of, core of what uh, MET calls or, or rapid response team calls, calls are all about. Uh, another question that I asked was, uh, uh, so the strongly disagrees are the ones, the, the strongly agrees are the fives, and um, uh, I mean, I'm really amazed that there's, there were four fours, so four people agreed that their heart fills with joy when a Met call is announced, um, which, uh, I mean, now I wish it wasn't anonymous so that I could refer people to the appropriate places. But, but this... Um, <laughs> This really, I mean, this only, we don't know if people actually don't like met calls or if they're just maybe a little bit ambivalent. So to find that out, I followed it up with this question, which was, um, I would rather be a medical registrar than attend met calls. And reassuringly for the whole met call movement, there's that uh, nobody agreed with this statement. And uh, the vast majority strongly disagreed. Um, so let's go back now to the, um, the proper study, the, the Jack study, so, and we think about what some of the implications of MET calls are for um, ICU trainees, at least from their perspective. So interestingly, two-thirds feel that uh, the MET, or being involved in the MET system, enhanced the quality of their training. And uh, from my little survey, some of the reasons for this the, were put down as uh, being um, that it enables them to develop skills in rapid assessment, synthesis of problems, and decision making. Also, they develop uh, diagnosis skills, dealing with undifferentiated problems, and obviously resuscitation skills. But another thing that's really valued is the leadership skills, negotiation with other teams, and all those non-technical skills that are so important to running an effective MET response. And also interestingly brought up was this idea that maybe, that just maybe for the careers of future intensivists, what goes on outside of our walls is going to be increasingly important. 
Um, from the Jacques study, 61% uh, thought that they were well trained in attending MET calls and that uh, the vast majority thought that ICU experience alone was sufficient training, which is a little bit of a disconnect when you consider that 77% said that they were not supervised. Um, so for me, uh, what the take-homes really are here is that there's a general lack of supervision and specific training and rapid response team responses, but trainees actually think they do have the skills. And this really adds up to, um, uh, where am I aiming? <laughs> to one word, danger for me, because uh, look, I can accept that there's gonna be crossover between different skill sets and working in different areas, but there's definitely things specific about MET calls that I think we need specific training in. And uh, it's kind of scary to me that there's people think that they're good at it, even though they're not supervised, and how can you get expert at anything unless you have feedback? So I think there's, um, the, there's an issue there. And um, because MET calls are not, <laughs> I, I couldn't actually remember where in my talk I'd put this slide, so now I have to kind of <laughs> feed it in. But MET calls are not uh, insignificant. There's a lot going on there, and you do need, um, you do, do need skills to prevent uh, from what uh, my friend Cliff Reed calls a chicken bomb scenario from happening, which is basically people running around like headless chickens. Um, uh, which isn't the worst case scenario. Um, <laughs> um, so do ICU registrars think that they should be part of the, the, the MET system? And uh, so despite the fact that uh, four out of five thought that the MET service was generally just seen as a general fix-it, and that half of them thought that they were often just doing the work of an RMO or resident, um, there was still this sort of ambivalence as to whether or not a lot of the things that people are responding to would be better off dealt with by a MET team or the admitting team. But interestingly, they, the majority felt that every hospital with an ICU should have a MET team, and the majority feel that the MET leader should be from ICU. So there is sort of this kind of disconnect there, um, which I think is interesting. And certainly from my little survey, I got basically the same things. Uh, most people strongly agreed that ICU trainees should be attending MET calls. Okay, so what did the uh, trainees think was actually good about rapid response teams? Um, so uh, a recurring theme is that the, there's a feeling that MET teams do actually improve ward care, and in particular, uh, a large number of people think that it accelerates appropriate end-of-life discussions. And again, I've already mentioned this idea that it gives experience at rapid assessment and that uh, trainees feel it's an essential part of training. Um, a few more quotes from my survey was that um, some people valued the social aspect of being able to get out and about and uh, move about in the wards instead of being stuck within the ICU. And again, but they just, they like that feeling of them making a difference. There's people who potentially could become critically ill and they get to nip it in the bud and stop it from happening. And more importantly, it makes everyone happy. The patients get good care, they're happy. The nurses get their problems solved, so they're happy too. And it breaks down the barriers. So you get to collaborate with other teams on the ward and uh, it's an opportunity to teach and support other staff and probably this is the emergency medicine dual trainees they love the uncertainty not knowing what's going to come next so what's bad well there's a recurring theme that people think uh, or ICU registrars think it's de-skilling the rest of the hospital they're really concerned about the fact that it uh, teams are not taking responsibility for their patients and that met teams are left to pick up the mess and also that it takes time and resources away from the ICU. Um, and also a few other quotes from uh, my little survey, which was this idea that uh, you turn up, everyone disappears, or I don't know whether it's better or worse, everyone just stands around and um, intimidates the patient. Um, 
then there's this other issue of having to justify that just because a MET call was called doesn't mean that you have to bring them to the ICU, and that often it's not even an ICU issue anyway. And certainly from people working in mandatory MET call systems, there's a feeling that they're not specific enough, often they're inappropriate, and there's just too damn many of them. And then, of course, the other problem is the uncertainty, not knowing what you're going to deal with. So, <laughs> so there you go. Um, one of the interesting things from the Jack study is that they did a multiple logistic regression uh, modeling to figure out which factors actually give um, trainees, gives them an overall positive impression of the MET teams. And I think this is interesting because it really centers on that if registrars think that the MET teams um, uh, positively impact managing patients on the ward and have a positive impact on ICU, then they have a positive view about the MET, MET team service. So where does this leave us? Um, so I also, one of my questions was uh, uh, to come up with some one-liners describing the overall impression of the MET team. So let's just see if I can remember them. One of them was uh, um, uh, channeling John Morgan from a recent Kickham ASM, which was that it's really just a, a way of um, transmitting REM sleep from the intensive care team to the um, admitting teams. Um, it, it's uh, uh, an exercise in treating the worried well. Um, but then others thought that, well, it's kind of a shitty job, but someone's got to do it. And uh, one of the others that I remember was a comment that, um, um, well, you can live with met calls, but some patients can't. And I think that's really hitting the crux of it. I'll just use the force. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, that should have done that sooner. Okay. Um, and uh, so the take homes really are that uh, the registrar's perspectives are important. They're, um, uh, the the response, the met calls impact on registrars. Registrars impact on met calls. So of course it's important. And importantly, it impacts on their training. And I think we've already highlighted that there is perhaps an opportunity that we can uh, target training a bit better with res um, respect to these MET calls. And certainly from the registrar's perspective that there may be different models that work better for them, maybe tiered responses, um, somehow trying to make the MET call systems more specific and also ensuring that teams on the wards maintain responsibility. But the bottom line is, is that Patients are actually more important than registrars, and on the whole, it seems that ICU registrars agree. And I think that really the key to um, uh, to engaging registrars in MET services um, is really to emphasise the benefits for patients on the ward and the benefits for ICU, as well as the fact that maybe their future jobs will depend on it. So thank you very much. For more podcasts from Antics, go to antics.com.au.